Okay, well, hello everyone. I'm Laurie Dennis at the Center for East Asian Studies, and I'm sitting in my office tonight in Madison, Wisconsin, which is my alma mater. I studied Chinese and politics back in the 1980s here when American, when visiting scholars and students were, were really just starting to come to American campuses at that time. And now at my university, there's over 3,000 students from China. It's the largest uh, international cohort by far on our campus. So that's an introduction of me. And I'll, I'll, let's, I'll ask you to maybe add in the chat where you are viewing this from and what, uh, what, you, what you teach and what your school is, if that's not going to require too much typing. So we can get a sense of who, who we are, because yeah. I think uh, people are from all over the place. And while you're doing that, I want to note that tonight's event is part of our center's East Asia and the Upper Midwest program. It's a summer program designed to offer perspectives on East Asia to teachers like you. And this is the third installment. The first one was about teaching the Korean War. And last summer we held one on um, the influence of Japan on architect and Wisconsin native Frank Lloyd Wright. And now we turn to China. We've kept this program intentionally small as we develop it. And the whole thing was supposed to be in person a, long, a full day of eating and talking together, but then COVID came. However, COVID did offer us an opportunity to look across the ocean to people we might not have been able to easily bring to campus otherwise. And so we have the great honor tonight to have with us Dr. Wang from the University of Hong Kong. You may have seen in uh, the curriculum guide that we have uh, has an introduction to him, but he is uh, he, he's a professor of humanities and social sciences and received his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Chicago down the road here. Then he moved around coasts, getting a, a degree, a master's of business administration at Stanford, then crossing the country to get his doctorate in history from Harvard. Dr. Wong worked in for several years in finance before turning to academia where the real money is. He studies the flow of people, goods, capital, and ideas in the Hong Kong region and beyond. His 2016 book on global trade in the 19th century was part of the materials we are sending and hopefully have sent to your houses. And uh, this book is also noted in um, unit three of our, of our curriculum guide. There's some notes on it there. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Wong now, and what we're going to do is he's going to introduce himself and offer some context on Hong Kong and talk a bit about his book and current research, and then we'll pause for some questions, including the questions that uh, several of you have submitted already, and then we, will, then we will turn to COVID and the impact of COVID and also some discussion on that. So I will turn it over now to Dr. Wang. Thank you very much, Laurie. Let me start by saying that it is a privilege and an honor to be able to share my research with this uh, distinguished group. Uh, Laurie shared with me some of the questions uh, that you have raised uh, after reading some of the materials and thinking about the topics. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussion um, and feel free to chime in at any moment in time. Uh, would like to try to keep a little bit more interactive if, uh, if there are questions that, you know, that are present concerns that you want to raise at any moment. Uh, let me start by sharing the screen um, of a PowerPoint that I prepared. All right, so this is uh, the book cover that you have all seen. Um, and I, I know it's, uh, it's a lot of reading and reading means different things in different contexts. And I think this is a book that is not necessarily written for um, the general audience. So hopefully I didn't bore you with too many of the details or the uh, academic uh, um, apparatus type of, um, type of uh, jargon. Um, but I would like to keep our discussion actually very relevant to today's environment. So can I start by talking a little bit about Hong Kong and then we'll delve into this whole business of Hokwa and the Canton system, which is basically my way of talking about the China trade that was situated in Canton of that period. Uh, and we'll certainly like to uh, share with you, um, you know, maybe some observations I have um, of COVID and the situation between, you know, um, China and US at the present moment. But just to uh, give you some context, um, 
Uh, Laurie gave you my uh, short bio. Yes, I did go to school uh, down the street from um, where many of you are um, in Chicago. And just to give you some context, uh, Laurie is right about the demographics. Uh, when I went to school at Chicago, I was, I think, um, the first cohort in many years going directly from Hong Kong. And in my college class, uh, the, in that, that cohort, there were two of us who went directly from Hong Kong. Of course, there are a lot more now. And more impressively, let me share with you uh, one little bit of statistical information um, uh, that uh, would shock you. In my class, how many students did I have from mainland China? One. That was a single student from mainland China. And it was, uh, it was a privilege to get to know her. And in, in those days, is the, the interaction between even people from Hong Kong and China wasn't, wasn't quite the same as what it is now. So it was uh, certainly eye-opening for us to see, oh, well, actually, we are more similar than I had thought, or you know, we're different in ways that I didn't quite expect. So that was um, eye-opening, and it was a lesson in of itself. And of course, times, that time has, uh, has changed since then, and uh, we can talk more about that um, and uh, think about this in the context of um, US-China uh, relations um, in the interim. But let me just start by um, talking to you about the city I love. You know, I was born and raised in Hong Kong. This is a city of the night sky there. Um, I have to, I'm sorry to say that it might not be quite as vibrant as it used to be. I, I saw in the chat um, that we have uh, participants from Hong Kong. So welcome to my uh, fellow Hong Konger. Um, and the city has gone through quite a few rounds of changes, um, even since my time there in the 80s. So I left Hong Kong in 1987. And I returned a little bit over a decade ago. Uh, at first, I thought I was just going to go do some research there for a year. And um, you know, as luck would have it, I ended up staying. And I've been uh, teaching at the University of Hong Kong since. Um, but just to, I, I know, it, you know you, you're all very uh, well versed in um, the history of, of that part of the world. But just so that you know, we have a short recap, let's just go through um, a few slides to, to get us all on the same page. So this is the, uh, the spatial. Um, representation of China. Um, as historians uh, you know, of, of this vintage, we love to um, question boundaries and uh, the arbitrary divide that you know, maps show, but you know, at least we need to situate where Hong Kong is. Um, and you see that is in the, um, the little uh, rectangle in the lower part of the picture. And you have a little bit of a blow up of Hong Kong on the side next to Taiwan. Um, I'm showing you an older picture, an older map as well, because it's important for us to understand Hong Kong, not just as, as a British colony that was established in uh, 1842, well, it says 1841, that's when they landed um, and took possession, but then it's 1842 when the treaty was signed and it officially became a British colony. Of course, that's important and that changed the course of development of Hong Kong. But it's also important for us to note that when Hong Kong became a British colony, or as I will explain, part of Hong Kong became a British colony, um, it happened in the context of um, this era of treaty port that as you see here with the dates, um, expanded up the coast and proliferated um, you know, in, in various uh, you know, coastal cities and uh, riverways of China. So Hong Kong was obviously very important because it's a colony, unlike some of the, and unlike most of the other places that were treaty ports, not quite, not quite ceded to foreign powers. Uh, but then it was one of many dots on this map, as you can see. Now, what's so special about Hong Kong, though, is that if we were to think about the long history of Hong Kong, well, not so long, I guess. American history is not that long. Hong Kong history is even shorter uh, if, as, a, as a British colony, uh, which then ended in 1997. But if we were to think through this whole stretch of time, the development of Hong Kong was special, but it became more special in the aftermath of the Second World War, um, at which time or around which time, uh, Hong Kong became the only foothold that Western traders or Westerners had on this map of China, because all the other trade ports were then um, taken back, returned uh, to, to the various um, rounds of Chinese government. So Hong Kong's role uh, became more important in the aftermath of the Second World War. Now, just to zoom in on the map that uh, you know, I showed you as a little uh, blow up um, next to Taiwan uh, two slides ago, you know, Hong Kong was not uh, a British colony all in one step. 
Um, the darker blue here is Hong Kong Island, where Hong Kong, the University of Hong Kong is located. That was part of the 1842 treaty that ceded the island and a few little dots that you see around it to the British. Uh, it was not until 1860 uh, that uh, the Kowloon Peninsula, along with it, uh, Song Kutas Island, the, the little, little one to the west of um, the peninsula, uh, became part of the colony. And as you can see here, um, well, I, what you cannot see here is that the topography. So Hong Kong Island is very hilly. So it's expanded quite a bit uh, through reclamation, but um, as it became British possession um, in 1842, basically the coastline was just where the, the hills would meet the sea. And they wanted um, Kowloon because you need a place for, for the boats to dock and also for uh, shipyards and repair. And it's not until 1898 that the rest of this map became part of British Hong Kong. And that was in a treaty um, uh, in which the British uh, leased you know, all the lighter shade areas from the Qing Empire uh, for 99 years. So that's 1898. So if we were to think about this uh, in 1898, I said 99 years, 1997. Hence, we have the issue of 1997. So that's a period that I lived through. Um, well, not in 1898, but <laughs> the later, later part of it. And the future of Hong Kong was highly uncertain. And we needed to figure out what was going to be uh, to become of Hong Kong. And that was a negotiation that happened in the 80s, 1980s. And um, what then happened was a relatively smooth transition. This was the handover. Uh, as you can, you can see here, it's all nicely choreographed with uh, British uh, representatives uh, on the right side of the screen and uh, PRC representation on the left. Smacked in the middle is the only person um, in, in the high echelons who transitioned from British um, governance to, uh, to what's called the uh, Special Administrative Region under the PRC. Um, that's Anson Chan. She, she was head of the civil service uh, that um, basically oversaw the transition. And you can see her smacked in the middle in red. So it is um, nice for us to, to situate that understanding because it's easy for us to even collapse the short history that started in the 19th century and try to appreciate it all together when um, in history unfolded um, with a lot of contingencies. And I'm trying to accentuate that a little bit more for our consideration. Um, so now back to what, what I said we'll do um, to look at this whole issue of US-China uh, relations. And I would like to start in the early 19th century and more with um, a view towards trading. Um, the picture you see here, very cosmopolitan and it is truly in that part of, uh, of the world, but it was not Hong Kong. It's a place that in uh, various types of um, Asian uh, languages we call uh, Guangzhou, Guangzhou, Romanized differently um, in Chinese and in um, uh, Japanese. Uh, but then it's also Romanized as uh, Canton, which you know, had a different origin. And I saw that one of our participants uh, come from a place that's associated with Canton. I'll be interested to, to hear if you pronounce it Canton or Canton. Uh, you know, Hong Kong people would now say Canton, but then as we look at some of the historical documents, it was actually called Canton before it's Canton. So uh, right, I'm, I happen to be uh, uh, speaking from Boston at the moment, and there is a town called Canton. And I used to think that it's silly Americans mispronouncing it. I didn't know that it's actually true to um, the historical origin of the place name. And the way we would approach this whole business of the Canton trade, uh, which I would uh, uh, submit for your consideration, was global trade um, that happened to include Canton as, um, as a nexus. So, you know, it's not just trade at one spot. It was, it was a location that weaved together many regional and global networks. And we'll approach it through the lens of this particular trader, uh, which I'm sure you're all bored of uh, from the cover of the book and by discussion, Ho Kwa is his name. Uh, his Chinese name is um, Bing Gam Wu Bing Jian. Um, and you see the years here. Um, he was born in the same year as Napoleon and his life ended one year after um, the treaty port era and when Hong Kong became the British colony. And I would try to uh, approach this early period, especially from a trading dimension, um, along lines that would not be unfamiliar uh, with us thinking about international trade now. So who do we trade with? And how do we communicate? 
what are the items that we can trade? And what does it mean to brand the commodities, um, the, the goods that you want to trade with your partners? So starting with, with whom we should trade. Um, this is a picture um, of the period actually slightly before uh, my, my focus in the book. This is the last quarter of the 18th century. Very colorful chart. You can see here representation from France, from, from the Dutch, uh, Swedish, Danish, and then, you know, obviously the red, uh, us Americans. And the timing, if, uh, if you look closely, is it, it's no coincidence that it was, you know, in the 1780s that you, you see the, uh, the red popping up here. But equally important to the many colors uh, we have here is the change over time in, in this last quarter of the century. You see the escalation of British power, in particular what I call uh, British company, which is the East India Company. So it's a chartered company, a uh, company chartered by, by the British um, uh, monarch to do trade, conduct trade in China. It went up quite significantly and at the expense of the more colorful segment uh, that we had on the left side of the chart. So issues um, on continental, uh, in continental Europe um, affected what was happening in Canton at that time. And many of the continental European powers could hardly maintain their foothold in Canton at that time, not because what's happening in Canton, but what's happening on the other side of the world. And the British grew at the expense of these continental European powers. Now, fast forward into the 19th century. Well, all those colors have basically disappeared. What we have left here is primarily the British East India Company and then a bit of the private merchants. Those, so these would be the non chartered companies um, from England. But then more importantly, you see this explosion in uh, the growth of the American trade. As I was explained uh, through the relationship of uh, Hokwa and his American trading partners, this provided Hokwa leverage to get out from a British hegemony. So it's always nice when you're trading not to have just one single buyer of your, of your, of your goods. Uh, it's nice to, to have uh, someone else who can, who can give you some leverage. And the Americans did it for um, the Chinese merchant that we will look at, uh, Hokwa. And this, I would uh, submit for consideration, was a boardroom picture in uh, the early part of the 19th century in Canton. So on the left, you have our guy, Chinese merchant Ho Kwa. On the right is John Murray Forbes um, of uh, local relevance here in Boston. Um, his family is, uh, is a, a bunch of uh, China traders, early China traders from New England. And as a matter of fact, uh, there is a family home of the Forbes, which has now become the China Trade Museum in Milton, Massachusetts. So uh, John, John Mary Forbes and his uh, brothers and cousins traded alongside Ho Kwa for quite a long time from the opening years of the uh, 19th century until Ho Kwa's death in 1843. And the Forbes continue to be associated with Ho Kwa's descendants um, throughout much of the rest of the 19th century. So how do we communicate? Um, I happen to be affiliated at Hong Kong U uh, with a group called the School of Modern Languages and Cultures. Uh, of course, we teach English in Hong Kong and we teach Spanish and French and everything. So all these modern languages. And as Laurie and I uh, explained, even in the, in the 80s, we learn our Chinese and, and languages from the other side of the world um, as well. But for this early period, there was no Chinese learn at univers university campuses in America. Um, and there was not much, a whole lot of English to learn in a formal setting in China either. So how did they communicate? Well, I wouldn't have time to go into the details of this. You'll see it in the book, but uh, this is the original of the document. Um, you have uh, uh, this episode of John Mary Forbes uh, writing to Ho Kua uh, because his cousin was going to report for duties in Canton to trade with Ho Kua, and John was not there to introduce uh, this guy, this cousin of his, to Ho Kua in person. So he had to write it out phonetically and ask the cousin to read out the Ho Kua in what was called pigeon. So this is English, but not quite English that you and I would readily understand. And what is the word pigeon? As we uh, delve deeper into the letter itself, you'll know that you'll notice that pigeon actually is what we would consider a corrupt pronunciation of the word business. So if you do 
pigeon, you do business. And that was the way that, you know, they, they, they talked about business. And that came to be the label for the language that they used in their communication. So this is the, the uh, interesting thing in terms of the power play, you know, it is English, but not quite English. We now call it Pigeon English, but then in those days it was just called Pigeon. And there's something that uh, Hukwa would understand uh, because they, uh, John Mary Forbes and his, and his brother and cousin actually trade alongside Hukwa and that's how they spoke, which is why John knew this is something that if you were to utter to Hukwa in this manner, he would understand. So that's the, the means of communication, at least verbally, um, in Canton. Now, what should we trade? Now, this is the interesting part. I, I showed you charts of tea, which was the primary commodity, very addictive, which is why you have the, uh, the annual um, return of the merchants to come back and purchase tea from Hokua in China. In China. This is the local relevance to, um, to Wisconsin, ginseng. So the, in China, um, there's production of ginseng uh, in what is what was known as Manchuria, closer to Korea. And that's, um, that's, that's a, a cherished commodity that Chinese people use in their, um, um, as a health, um, um, not supplement, but that's, that's just a food that has uh, uh, wellness uh, implications. And when the American traders went to uh, Canton, they thought, oh, we have our ginseng too. And they sold this ginseng. And for anyone with, uh, I guess, uh, uh, background in that part of the world um, around Hong Kong, uh, we, I, I had that growing up too. And my mom bought it from uh, America and the place of origin is Wisconsin. And we call it American ginseng. As a matter of fact, we called it uh, ginseng of the flowery flag. Uh, the, the, what, what is known as our national flag is the flowery flag because it's just so, so busy to, to the eyes of, of, um, of uh, the people in Qing China. But that's major cultural miscommunication. Uh, our ginseng here from America is very cooling. It's a cooling tonic, whereas uh, Korean ginseng is supposed to be fortifying. So they, they have totally different properties, even though they look like the same roots. So they try that. Um, now I, I, I pay a lot of money for it, but then in early 19th century, people didn't really care for American ginseng that much. And what else did they try? They tried to sell fur, especially when the ships were going through Alaska and over. Uh, but think this way, um, if you were to arrive in, um, at the early part of the 19th century at a place like Florida, which is more or less the same type of ecological setting, and you try to sell fur to people in Florida, that's not a tenable proposition. I mean, the only, the, the only uh, absurdity that I can think of is uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, you know, people my mom's age were all crazy about fur. Not, not, most of them could not get it, but then they would wear that for Chinese New Year, which is usually in late January, early February, and not always cold. And some of them would be sweating in their fur, but they needed to do it. So uh, that didn't happen much in the early part of the 19th century as well, certainly not in Canton. So what did they find? Opium, um, just as addictive, if not more addictive, actually, I'm sure, you know, depending on, uh, it's certainly more um, harmful to your health, but then uh, that's yet another addictive substance that uh, would create a recurring trade. So opium and tea, they were the two commodities that ended up uh, creating the circular flow um, of trade uh, towards the end of the Canton era into the treaty port era. Of course, in the book, I mentioned uh, silver as well. And that's something that, uh, you know, is also a global commodity that circulated, um, you know, the Spanish uh, silver coins um, through the uh, American network um, uh, via Manila to, um, to Canton. So if we were to think through this whole issue of the struggle that um, is actually first the British and then the Americans, had uh, trying to come up with something that the Chinese would want. There is some truth to this emperor's um, utterance in 1793. Our celestial empire possesses all things in prolific abundance and lacks no product within its own borders. I mean, obviously there's a lot of arrogance here, but then it's also the reality that many of these foreign traders faced 
uh, at the end of the 18th uh, century, the early part of the 19th century, until they found opium and, of course, uh, silver before that, which created all sorts of issues. Now, we have some questions about silver already, as I saw from the chat, um, and it's an important um, note that I should make here. We tend to think of silver as something that's so standardized because you, know, you have all these commodity exchanges, uh, you have standard prices for delivery of copper, silver um, at various locations at different prices. Um, and we tend to think of it as just one thing. Whereas in the 19th century, that was not. So you have here some uh, silver ingots, uh, silver tails in, um, in China, and uh, the lower right, you have some uh, Spanish silver coins. All these things trade not really as just some substance by weight, but because of the way they look, uh, because of the forms they took, they took on different connotations of purities um, and uh, credit worthiness. So there was an active market of silver in one form versus another. So in, in, in our world in 2021, we are 2022, we have totally flattened all these things out to, to one um, you know, global commodity when you know, in the early part of the 19th century, they all meant different things. So you know, just, uh, just some um, trivia note, um, the lower right-hand side, why, why would what was known as the Buddha head or the pillar coins uh, be worth so much? Well, because um, people in China and people around the world trusted this silver coin in terms of the purity and the insignia on it actually conveyed a strong sense of where they were from and why are they round with ridges? Well, the ridges are there so that you cannot chisel away some of the silver because if you were to just take a little bit away at a time, you will. You can, you can take quite a bit of a discount um, off of the silver coin, uh, silver dollar, and that wouldn't be fair to whoever's receiving that. So silver was not really a flattened commodity. It was as much of a global um, merchandise as everything else with um, different uh, value based on the form it took, the place, the, its place of origin, and also who, who carry that to whom. So let's move on from there and think about this whole issue of branding. I would submit for your consideration that before we had um, uh, Apple's uh, Steve Jobs, uh, the Marlboro Man and Kentucky Fried Chicken's uh, Colonel, we had this global brand of Hokwa. Uh, well, now you've seen him, I'm sure that was not quite something that uh, uh, loomed large in your mind when you, think, when you thought about uh, brand officials. But this is the painting that started it all. So this British painter, uh, George Chinnery, he traveled to the Purifa Delta area, so Canton and Macau, uh, by way of India. So he was basically part of the um, British imperial diaspora that moved with um, uh, the British Empire. And he I'm painted- I'm just gonna have this, to watch, rewatch the film. Uh, we, we, this, this painting um, was prepared in 1827. And you can see that it proliferated. Um, a different, slightly different form of it, different pose, but then you have quite a few of them up and down the Eastern seaboard um, in America. And equally interestingly, if I can advance my slide, there you go. You see um, this portrait of Hokwa by a Chinese painter by the name of uh, Lampua. It's uh, much simplified and reduced. So you don't have as much of the uh, chiaroscuro, the pillar and the, the backdrop is down to this frame. Well, this one, apparently by Lumpo as well, was even more simplified. That's what, that's what he painted uh, for Hokwa that came to be uh, part of the collection of the Ipswich Public Library right up the street here from Boston. And you see many of these paintings of, of Hokwa different ages. And Hokwa was deliberate in gifting these portraits to his uh, trusted confidants um, in America in particular, um, as he sealed the relationship with them. As a matter of fact, he, he leveraged this whole brand so much that you know, I've found traces of uh, painting that he sent to India and Bombay, the present day Mumbai. England for sure. So the whole trading network uh, came to be uh, populated by these likeness, the likenesses of Hokwa. And it's not just paintings. Uh, this is a box from the Peabody Essex Museum. Um, you see here um, the, the, the variety of the tea um, 
on top, and then hokwa, the name in the bottom, and then the batch number um, in the bottom of the box, which corresponds to nothing on the left-hand side of the screen in Chinese. So the hokwa, the brand itself, has some currency uh, in the American market because this guy was the one who, um, who structured the trade uh, between the US and China at the time, and he was the uh, he was a merchant people wanted to deal with. So why do I tell you all about these things? Well, let me just um, say that the as I studied this early part of the 19th century, which didn't seem so long ago, and I was trying to struggle through some of the questions that uh, uh, some of you had in your um, uh, chat box. Um, how did things change? What was it before if it changed? What I've noticed is that if you were to dial back to the early part of the 19th century, when America was just starting to show up in Canton in China, the world was a lot more fluid. What we consider to be the international rules of trade, speak English, uh, you know, you have a commodity market, uh, prices are regulated just fine. Um, you have, you have, uh, you, you have uh, designated partners that you would trade with and that doesn't change. That wasn't quite the case. Otherwise, the Americans would not have entered um, the competition at that time, and you wouldn't have seen the, the struggle of the various commodities that tra they traded and the early efforts in this early modern world, um, how Hokwa uh, tried to structure his uh, transactions with the Americans. And I would suggest for our consideration uh, that this remains instructive today because we are living in a world in which China has taken center stage once again, and the rules of engagement, very much West-centric, uh, Europe and American-centric, are not quite uh, enough to confine all the participants um, to one system and facilitate uh, the engagement that we want to see in the world today. So let's think about that a little bit. Um, it's not just a history of, uh, it's not just a lesson of history. It is to think through a period in which America was not the dominant power. I mean, let's not take that for granted. It's been a relatively short history, even though it's most, you know, most years in our lifetime. Um, and China was once upon a time, at least an equal partner, if not more in this relationship. Uh, in the world of Hokwa, certainly not more, because the Americans were just riding on the coattails of the British to show up in Canton at that time. And Hokwa was the one who basically bankrolled the trade uh, with consignment. So that's not to say that uh, we, we need to be um, uh, subservient uh, to any party in uh, the world of trade, finance, or di diplomacy in our environment. But it's also a good reminder uh, that the, the international relations, international trade, that's a fluid world and we need to understand how we can approach it with this historically informed framework. That would help us uh, appreciate the unevenness, um, the rebalancing of power um, over time and hopefully that would educate us, that would help us formulate more creative ways um, in structuring our relationship uh, between China and America going forward. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, let's, let's have uh, more of an exchange. Um, I don't want to bore you with more of my presentation and I know there are a lot of good questions uh, that have come in.